Welcome to Concord Baptist Church. We're in a few minutes late here. Uh, powers of darkness overtaking me. And uh, let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Great Heavenly Father, Lord, again, we thank you for watching over us this day. Lord, uh, bring us home safely. And Lord, I thank you that uh, Richard uh, had no broken bones. Lord, uh, could have been a lot worse. We thank you for that miracle. And Lord, pray you give him a speedy recovery. For it's in Jesus' name we pray and ask these things. Amen. All right. Well, let's play a song by the Gibsons. Through great sorrows, my God gives us love. 
today I thought I'd share this with you but Richard boy that works with us we were at work today and a customer come in he was he had a load of watermelons on he was working on his truck and uh, Jazz and I had gone into town to run some errands picked up our lunch came back and we were sitting in the lunchroom eating our dinner, and uh, I heard this scream, and uh, I mean just scream, a few times, and uh, we dropped our forks and ran out the lunchroom, and Richard was laying out in the parking lot on the ground next to the truck that he was working on. And uh, what had happened was they were back in the 18-wheeler back under the trailer. And he was reaching under to pull a fifth-wheel pin. And as they were backing under, they ran over him and uh, over his foot and stopped and so the truck the 18 wheeler was sitting on his foot and he tried to twist to get it out and hit the ground and and uh, his foot still under there and they're yelling to this romanian truck driver to pull back up and he pulled back up and drove off his foot and uh, one of the other fellows that work with us kimmy He's a big old boy, about 300 some pounds. And, uh, boys on the ground hurting bad. I thought when I heard the yells and he said he got hit, run over by the truck, I was expecting to see blood and guts all over. But anyway, uh, Tim picked him up, and carried him into the lunchroom, and set him on the couch. And uh, he was in bad pain. We were getting some ice on it, and I got him some leave and all that stuff. And driver he was all upset but anyway long story short i took him on into leesville to lexton uh urgent care and they got him in there and 
got him some pain medicine and took an x-ray and they said there were no broken bones. Now that's just a miracle of the Lord. Amen. Just, just want to give God the praise for that. And a couple hours later, I went back and picked him up and brought him back to his vehicle. But uh, he'll be on crutches for a little bit. But praise the Lord, it didn't break anything. He had steel-toed boots on. and uh, But still, with that kind of weight on top of you, you know, that's a, that's a scary thing when you, I never did finish dinner, hey Ben, but when you go out and see somebody laying there, uh, balled up in pain and yelling, and they tell you you got run over by a truck, and I'll tell you what, that, I just thank God, I just thank God that nothing was broken, hey Ben, and so you pray for him, pray for Richard that he has a speedy recovery, amen, but can't thank God enough for that. Uh, tonight, we were going back to the chemistry of man here. I want to show you this. They have a diagram here. Let's see if I can get it over here. And uh, that's supposedly uh, a diagram of man in the garden uh, with the earth, with God. And it, it says this. So number one represents the earth. Square number two represents our fellow man. And square number three represents God. Square number four represents man. The line number one connecting square number one stands for our body, which by, by which we are related to the earth. The line number two connecting with square two signifies the soul through which we are in fellowship and relation to our fellow man. Line number three, connecting square four, represents the spirit through which we have fellowship and union with God. Again, I'll show that to you one more time so you can get another look at it or you can look at it later. Now, he says that this is a diagram, diagrammatic picture of man in the image of God as he was created. Now, we're a bunch of squares. <laughs> I got a line on that too. It says it right here. And uh, as he was created, God had said to Adam, the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now, we all know that Adam lived to be 930 years old physically. But spiritually, he died that day. And he says, the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Just what happened when Adam did eat of the forbidden tree? Certain it is that he did not die physically that day, for he lived over 900 years after that time. Equally clear, it is that he did not die as far as his soul was concerned. He still had the ability to fellowship with his fellow creatures, to love, to sorrow, to rejoice, and to mourn. But the death was the first of all spiritual death. The moment Adam ate of the forbidden tree, he died spiritually. That is, his fellowship, his union with and his relationship to God were immediately broken. He broke with the source of life and died. This is clearly evident from his conduct, for instead of seeking after God, he feared God fled from him and hid himself among the trees of the garden. He was cut off from the source of spiritual life. Line number three was broken, and although contact with the earth and other men continued for the term of physical life, man was out of touch with God. As a result, he also died physically. This physical death began immediately, but did not culminate until 900 years after. I may cut a flower with its stem from the plant. It is cut off from its source of life. It is potentially dead, but the actual withering process may be delayed by putting the stalk in water, which will keep it apparently alive for a few days. But the fun, I guess they'd call that life support, wouldn't you? Apparently alive for a few days, but the final result is death. 
so too when man died spiritually he was cut off from the source of life and he continued to live physically for a time but the result was bodily as well as spiritual death this then is the condition of man through sin the image of God which consists of body soul and spirit has been lost the man now consists of body and the soul but he is spiritually dead to this extent then man has become more like a brute beast than like God now you think about that it said having eyes we see not having ears we hear not why because spiritually we're dead we're dead spiritually to the things of God and that's why the Bible says in John uh, chapter 3 he said you must be born again you must be born again Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Amen. This then is the condition of man through sin. The image of God which consists of body, soul, and spirit has been lost. The man now consists of body and soul, but he is spiritually dead. To this extent then, man has become more like a brute beast than like God. A careful study of social conditions and moral conditions, even among the most civilized people of the world, will bear out this assertion. Since man lowered himself, as it were, to the level of a brute, God dealt with him in harmony and with his degraded condition, even his diet, which before the fall was limited to conform to high position in the image of God, was changed so that it became more like the diet of a beast than that of a being made after the image of the Almighty. A very interesting illustration of this fact is found in the first three chapters of Genesis. Man by his fall is out of touch with God. He does not seek after God, but only lives for those things for which an animal lives. The two strongest and most deep-seated of all the instincts of man are self-preservation and self-propagation. The man outside of God and outside of Christ lives for these two things only. Matter of fact, I was watching a cooking show and a man from Wisconsin said that he wanted to start his own business and he was looking for fame and fortune. That's what he was looking for. And I said, that man's not going to win. He's got his motive all messed up. And of course he didn't. But the man outside of God and outside of Christ lives for those only two things. He may reach a high state of moral conduct, ethics, refinement, and education. But every ambition of the unregenerate man, traced to its lowest, will be found to be selfish in the extreme. I've never been to one. I've heard about them. But, you know, they talk about Black Friday or something after Thanksgiving where everybody waits all night to go into a store to get a great deal on something and people go in there and they pull on each other they fight each other fight start and everything is everything else so that they could grab a certain item that somebody else has that's selfishness amen that's in the extreme in this way, man lowered himself in some instances apparently far below the unintelligent creature. This is seen very clearly in the curse which God pronounced upon man. Notice first of all Genesis 1.11, And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass and herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. It will be seen from this verse that the earth at the word of the Lord brought forth two kinds of vegetation called grass and herb yielding seed. Herbs are classified into two groups, those that bear edible seed and those whose foliage, leaves, stalks, etc. are edible. In the Dutch, the distinction is indeed by two words. The first is grassuities, and the second, crude salad. The first word is translated in English as grass and is used in the original 
to indicate all herbs. I don't worry about the original. I want you to understand that now I worry about the King James Bible. That's what I read. That's what I get everything from. And I don't need to go back to some uh, Hebrew and Greek or Latin or Aramaic or anything else. I've got an English Bible that God gave us so that we could understand it. Amen. And even if I could read it, uh, which all these professors that say they can really can't, what they have is a uh, concordance or a lexicon or something like that with trying to get the definition of a word in the Hebrew or the Greek uh, to lift themselves up to propagate themselves. Amen. Uh, the Bible's given to us in about uh, sixth grade English so that we can understand it and they want us to go to them to find out what it really means I don't need to go to them to find out what it really means God gave me a Bible and a spirit amen and understanding and he said if I lacked wisdom for me to ask for it he'd give it liberally and upbraideth not he says if any man lack wisdom let him ask of God who giveth liberally and upbraideth not and so I don't need uh, some Baptist Pope or some Methodist Pope, or any Pope, for that matter, to try to explain to me what the Scripture is in some other language that they neither can read and neither can I. Uh, even if they had it, which they don't. Amen? They've got pieces and copies. They don't have a complete uh, Hebrew and Greek uh, Word of God, as they say. Now, the English translators gave it to us, it took seven years to translate it into English so the common man could read it. And now they want to send you off to Bible school and think you're going to learn it in four years. And then you're going to go out and you're going to be able to use some big words and people can look at you as uh, Dr. Doolittle or Dumfinkel or whatever and uh, make them feel all good and happy. Um, you know, in in the dark ages and even back in the 1600s when the catholic church they didn't want the people to be able to know it and understand it they wanted to tell them what it said that way they could keep them in superstition and everything else um, you and i don't have to do that. We've got the word of God. And you know what I, I found out? I, I knew some people when I first got saved that couldn't read. And they got saved and they started trying to read the Bible and they would follow along. And you know, before they died, they could read the word of God. It was used as a textbook in the early days. Amen. But anyway. Uh. The second class of herbs includes those whose fruit or fruit receptacles edible, such as beans, peas, tomatoes, eggplant, etc. Turning to the 29th verse of the first chapter of Genesis, we notice that the former class of herbs called grass, amen, uh, in scripture was given for food of beast as well as the herb bearing seed. But man was limited to his vegetable diet to the herbs which bore edible fruit, Genesis 129 and 30. God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed to you it shall be for me and to every beast of the earth and to every fowl of the air and to every thing that creepeth upon the earth wherein there is life I have given every green herb for me and it was so. The above two verses, when read carefully, will show this distinction. So God uh, made us vegetarians when we first started out. Amen. This, however, was previous to the fall. When sin entered into the world through the disobedience of Adam and man, broke with his God, he became spiritually dead and thereby lowered himself in his constitution to the level of the animals. And in perfect conformity with his fallen condition, God now supplied him with animal food, Genesis 3, 17 and 18. 
And unto Adam, he said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat there, eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. You know, we, we did a study and we took the timeline from... Uh, where the Bible says in Genesis where God gave the genealogy of the men and, and uh, of their children and so-and-so begat this one and he lived 130 years and he begat so-and-so and after he begat so-and-so he lived another 600 years or whatever. And he went down through that and I went through it and I studied it. And, you know, when you first read Genesis, the first part of Genesis about the fall of man. Somehow in our mind, we think that this is, that there was this big gap in there. You know, this happened and there was this big gap. But when you go back and read and study, you find out that that garden was still there when Adam was exiled and he had to go earn his bread by the sweat of his face. And he had thistles and thorns and all that. That garden was still there being guarded with a flaming sword. Amen. To keep man out. And as Adam's children were born, he gave birth to sons and daughters and stuff. And they're out there in the field and they're sweating. And I mean, they're working so hard and the sun's beating down on them. Amen. And all this going on. They look over and they see the gate of that garden and they can see through the gate the, the luscious fruits and everything on the trees and Adam has to sit there and tell them that the reason they're out here doing this is because what he did in there when he disobeyed God. Amen. And as we go down through the lineage there, um, Lamar, Noah's father, and some of them were still alive just before the flood. And they all had to look back. That whole uh, Adam's generation had to look back and see that. And Adam lived, like I said, to be 930 years. And it wasn't but 100 and some years after uh, that left about 800 years, somewhere around there. That's not exact, but somewhere around there where he lived after he was exiled out of that garden and all his loved ones that he gave birth to and they gave birth to uh, and they had to labor and work and he had to tell him that was because I sinned against God. God had made us perfect, given us all this and I messed it up. So when a person's born, he's born one part dead. In, Gen in uh, not Genesis, I'm sorry, in Titus, in chapter 3, in verse 5, the Bible says, well, verse 4 and then 5, but after that the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, washing of regeneration, all right, now, and renewing of the Holy Ghost, well, when did you ever have the Holy Ghost, you had it in Adam in the garden, and when he lost it, that's what happened to us, all right, when you get born again, the Bible says that we're sealed into that day of redemption by that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the Holy Ghost, amen, um, uh, let's see here. I wanted to show you something here in Matthew, Matthew chapter one, it says the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now see, he starts the lineage off here with Abraham. And he said, Abraham begot Isaac and Isaac begot Jacob and Jacob begot Judas and his brother and Judas begot fairies and 
Zerah of Thamar, and Pharaoh begot Ezra, and Ezra begot Aram, and Aram begot Aminadab, and Aminadab begot Nason, and Nason begot Salmon, and Salmon begat Boaz of Rechab, and Boaz begot, begat Obed of Ruth, and Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David the king, and David the king begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Urias. Now, it goes on down, reads off the rest, 14 generations in each one. And uh, it's shown you that the lineage of the Hebrew race starts with Abraham here. Amen. Uh, he wasn't a Hebrew yet. He was one afterwards. But that's where God likens that generation. And this is the one that brought to us a new life through Jesus Christ. Amen. And because of that, you and I can be born again by simply believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, being willing to turn from our sin and turn unto God through the blood of Jesus Christ. And he says in verse 17, so all the generations from, well, let me back up to verse 16. And Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who was called Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. And from David unto the carrying away into Babylon are 14 generations. And from the carrying away into Babylon unto Christ are 14 generations. All right. And then we have the birth of Christ there. So he's dealing in generations. Then when we get over to the book of Luke, he starts with the generation of, uh, let's see, let me go back here. And it says, in the Holy Ghost, verse 22 of chapter 3 of Luke, and the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon the voice of a voice came from heaven, which said, Thou art my beloved son, and thee I am well pleased. And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being as was supposed the son of Joseph. Of course, we know he's the son of God, which was the son of Heli. <clears throat> now, this lineage is very important because there was a curse on Joseph's side through Jeconiah, one of Solomon's sons. And through these generations, as you study them, you see how God actually keeps his holiness, keeps his word, and still is able to bring forth Christ as our Savior. Amen. And make him king. And he had to be part of the royal throne. But anyway, that's another story. I'll get into all that later. He says, which was the son of Mathat, which was the son of Levi, which was the son of Melchi, which was the son of Janna, which was the son of Joseph, which was the son of Mattathias, which was the son of Amos, which was the son of Nahum, which was the son of Esli, which was the son of Nagi, which was the son of Matt, which was the son of Mattathias, which was the son of Simea, which was the son of Joseph, which was the son of Judah, which was the son of Joanna, which was the son of Risa, which was the son of Zerubbabel, which was the son of Salathiel, which was the son of Neri, which was the son of Melchi, which was the son of Adai, which was the son of Cosim, which was the son of Elmodim, which was the son of Ur, which was the son of Josie, which was the son of Eliezer, Eliezer, I mean, which was the son of Joram, which was the son of Methat, which was the son of Levi, which was the son of Simeon, which was the son of Judah, which was the son of Joseph, which was the son of Jonan, which was the son of Lycan, which was the son of Melia, which was the son of Benan, which was the son of Mattatha, which was the son of Nathan, which was the son of David, which was the son of Jesse, which was the son of Obed, which was the son of Boaz, which was the son of Salmon, which, son, which was the son of Nathan, which was the son of Abinadab, which was the son of Aram, which was the son of Ezra, which was the son of Phares, which was the son of Judah, which was the son of Jacob, which was the son of Isaac, which was the son of Abraham, which was the son of Therah, which was the son of Nacor, 
which was the son of Sarek, which was the son of Ragu, which was the son of Phalek, which was the son of Heber, which was the son of Selah, which was the son of Canaan, which was the son of Arphaxad, which was the son of Shem, which was the son of Noah, which was the son of Lamech, which was the son of Methuselah, which was the son of Enoch, which was the son of Jared, which was the son of Maliel, which was the son of Canaan, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam. Now here you go, which was the son of God. Amen. Adam is called the son of God. And when he sinned, when he disobeyed the Lord, that holiness, that soul, sin took place and fellowship was broken. And you'll notice that the Lord came back and it was the Lord that reestablished fellowship with Adam. He took the initiative. Adam went out and made himself an apron of fig leaves for him and his wife. That's your first order of the Eastern star in the Masonic lodge. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> the Lord came along, said that wasn't good enough. It was going to be blood. And it says that the Lord made them coats of skins. Now, how do you get skins off an animal? You have to slay it. Now think about this. And this is what sin does. Here's this beautiful garden. They had it made, a paradise, the garden of God. And all these little animals walking around them, especially, you ever look at a little lamb? Aren't they the cutest things? Hey man, one of the kids in our church got in trouble because I uh, gave them a little poem and they took it to school. They said, Mary had a little lamb. Her father shot it dead. And now it goes to school with her between two hunks of bread. <laughs> Boy, to get in trouble. But anyway, think of that beautiful paradise that God had made. Put man in it, gave him everything. These little animals walking through the garden, munching on some herb, amen, not smoking it as some of you try to do, or tried to do when you were younger, but they were eating. And then all of a sudden, the cry of the little lamb, when its throat had to be slit, and its blood poured out on the ground as a sacrifice for sin, and the skins ta taken and made coats for Adam and Eve. You see, Adam didn't commit adultery, fornication, or anything else. What he did is just simply obeyed God, disobeyed God. He took of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You see, it doesn't matter how little your sin is, it costs the same price. Took the blood of the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm sure that all heaven was in shock the day that they hung Jesus on the cross. The tree that they hung him on, I'm sure it looked up and said, what are you doing to the one that created me? And all of heaven must have been in shock. And when the father put our punishment on him for our sin, how heaven must have been upset. But God could not acquit the wicked. And in order for him to redeem us, as he redeemed Adam with the blood sacrifice, he had to shed the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That's what he did for you and I. What have you done for him? Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you that you allowed us to be here again. We thank you for Richard, Lord, that he was injured no more than he was. And Lord, pray you give him a speedy recovery. Amen. Thank you for tuning in. I hope you got a little something out of it. Amen. God bless you. We love you. Good night.